I'm back doing this video for MedPage today. I'm joined by Dr. Chul Kim, Dr. Andre Vandross, and we're going to talk about KRAS G12C. So, Dr. Kim, there's a new drug out there. It's uh, it's uh, Sotoracib, Sotoracib for G12C. Now, I think um, people who follow the oncology drug space, we they will know that trying to drug RAS has been the holy grail of oncology for a long time. And I like to tell people that drugging RAS is like sleeping on the side of the mountain. Uh, it's, it's, it's a precarious perch. Dr. Kim, why has it been so hard to drug RAS? Uh, why, and why is RAS so interesting to uh, lung cancer doctors? Yeah, so the uh, RAS pathway has been implicated in non-small cell lung cancer in terms of pathophysiology. And many, as you know, many um, uh, you know, cancers with... Um, uh, uh, cancers have uh, the pathway alteration in the in the RAS pathway. So, you know, we talk about KRAS, EGFR, and others. Um, it's been difficult to drug RAS because it was hard to find the right molecule to really hit the, um, you know, mutant form of the, the RAS. Um, for example, you know, krs C has not been able to be druggable, uh, drugged uh, up until now. Um, now we have you know, several drugs in the development, and one drug, which is RASIP, has been approved by FDA based on um, the uh, code break data uh, showing the response rate around 35 to 40%. Um, and this is an oral pill that patient can take a kind of you know, uh, daily basis and can induce um, tumor shrinkage, which is remarkable because this is the first time that we see that a RAS driven lung cancer um, is able to be treated with uh, uh, targeted therapy. Andre, you're no stranger to targeted therapies in lung cancer. Uh, when you think about targeted therapies, uh, what are the drugs that you know that you're using often, and uh, what are the response rates you're expecting to see? First, I'm just pleased that we're going to be able to open pathway-specific clinics um, and get special subspecialty training in such pathways. Um, I am a phase one investigator. I use a variety of um, targeted therapies. You know, some of the you know most I can't mention now, but um, in general. You know, I've used the, the K, KRAS G12C uh, in, uh, inhibitors um, in my clinics, um, have seen responses. And some of those responses that um, I'm expecting to see, you know, between 20 and 30%, um, that would be nice. And, and obviously the, the number of complete responses, um, as I discuss with patients, it wouldn't necessarily be high, but um, it's a good place to start to get those partial responses. And then obviously the long-term question is and whether that's actually going to correlate with um, having a clinical impact um, on the patients. And those are the discussions that I have to have um, with my patients. That's, 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 that's right, I think. And Dr. Kim, when, when I look up KRAS G12C, the first thing that pops up is an ad that says, are, have you found the unseen 13%? Uh, so it looks like, <laughs> looks like people are on the hunt for KRAS G12C. Um, my question to you is, uh, do you think that number is, is, is fair and accurate? Uh, is it about 13% of non-small cell lung cancer? Are there other RAS mutations that you know, we're not drugging? Uh, how do you think about G12C in the, in the landscape of, of, of all druggable alterations? Right, so uh, there are various subtypes of KRAS mutations in non-small cell lung cancer. There's a G12C, which is one of the most common form of uh, KRAS mutations. There's a G12B and B, and there are trials uh, you know, trying to target those um, non-G12C mutations nowadays. Um, so yeah, um, in terms of the, the frequency or prevalence of G12C, I think that's about right, you know, 13%, uh, you know, depending on what studies you're, you're looking at. So it's not uncommon mutation. And, um, you know, personally, you know, the, the rate of response that we see with sorasib is not as high as, you know, other drugs that we use in lung cancer, for example, you know, uh, osmertinib or electinib or lorlatinib, regatinib. However, I think this is, um, you know, a good start and there's, uh, you know, multiple studies looking at combination therapy approaches. And I think this is a good um, option for patients and in my mind, clearly better option than those taxol, although, you know, we don't have direct uh, randomized data comparing those two. There is an ongoing study actually, um, you know, comparing the uh, sort of RASI versus the taxol, I believe in the second line setting, and that will give us an answer as to whether sort of RASI will lead to, you know, a better uh, survival, especially the overall survival. That's an important study to kind of, you know, look at when the result, results are out. Uh, but at this point, in term, based on response rate and some of the side effect uh, profile, I think this is a favorable option in my mind compared with those taxol second line therapy. 
Yeah, that's that's the question. So I guess um, one thing you're pointing out that's really important to point out is that uh, this is a targeted therapy drug that's approved for subsequent lines, uh, not for initial treatment. Uh, and so we're still expecting people to get probably chemo IO as the initial treatment. And then they're going to face the choice. Uh, are they going to go to the G12C inhibitor or are they going to do what you do otherwise, which is probably Taxol, but maybe Taxol Ramucirumab, Dr. Kim. Where's the Ramucirumab? <laughs> oh, Ramucirumab. Yeah, I forgot to mention it. A uh, very important combination. I mean, there, so there was randomized study comparing this Taxol plus Ramucirumab versus this Taxol showing you know, modest over a certain benefit, you know, based on the uh, REBEL trial. And so, yeah, I mean, in my practice, do I use it? Yes, but uh, selectively because uh, the toxicity increases with the combination. Yes. So I think that'll be a very important study to, to look at, which is whether or not uh, this drug uh, can outperform Taxol. And I think I tried to, you know, do some cross-trial comparisons, but it's quite difficult because, and if anyone's aware of this, you can email me because I want to find this, which is that, does anyone know the response rate to Taxol or Taxol Ramucirumab in just the G12C cohort? Has that been reported? Not that I'm aware of. Yeah. yeah. So now people are looking at different segments of, you know, the KRS mutation. So maybe one day we'll have the data, but I am not aware of any data at this point. Dr. Vandross, in your experience with these G12C drugs, uh, uh, there, there's, there's not, this is not the only one. There's a lot of enthusiasm here. Um, how do you, how do you think about this landscape? What do you think is coming? Um, are, are you optimistic about this space that this will, this will yield and bend to targeted therapy? Sure, I think there's going to be there's definitely going to be room for it, and even other tumor types. I know we're talking about um, lung cancer, but seeing some responses in um, colon cancer as well, um, and and frankly, they're they're being combined with other uh, uh, other medications, um, other targeted therapies in order to get maximal benefit. So I think that you know once again expanding to other tumor types uh, as well as combining with other uh, 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 targeted therapies. I learned in oncology that uh, uh, the best way to have a great study is to not have a control arm. That's what they taught me. So, <laughs> <laughs> so I see, I see that that's uh, that's employed here, um, Dr. Kim. Uh, you know, I'll, I'll, one last thought on this on this drug because you know I think um, you know the data are the data, which is that you know we know the response rate. Uh, let's talk about the median duration of response, though. The median duration of response uh, it wasn't as long as I would have expected, Dr. Kim. What do you think about that median DOR? Yeah, it was not um, as good as some of the other drugs I was mentioning before. For example, alectinib, you know, median uh, duration of response was very long with those, um, you know, off DKIs uh, or, you know, osmertinib. Um, the, it was uh, 11 months, if I'm not mistaken, right? And so it wasn't as bad as I, you know, um, given the, the, the over response rate of 37%. So, um, you know, if you have a response and can stay on the drug for about a year or 11 months, I think it can, um, you know, have some positive impacts on on patients' quality of life. Yeah, I think um, uh, uh, that 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 um, that's an interesting median DOR. The and the PFS was about six months, and so it'll be interesting to see. I'm very curious what happens when it goes up against Taxol. Um, Dr. Vandross, any last thoughts on this? You know, you have a, this new drugs out there. Um, you know, got an uncontrolled study. You got a response rate. You got a median DOR to hang your hat on. You got an ongoing randomized trial. Um, if you were seeing a patient off study, is this entering into your armamentarium? Where are you going to use it? You're going to use second line, maybe third line. How do you think about this drug? It, I think I'm just going to uh, go back to what Dr. Kim was saying earlier. It's going to be a personalized, it's going to be an individualized discussion with the patient. Um, uh, present the information, present the data. Um, uh, just even this morning, uh, talking with a patient, how, what is their preference? How much do they want to be on a therapy? What is their current um, quality of life status, uh, the, their disease status? Some people don't want to be off of a therapy. Um, and so I would feel comfortable uh, presenting this as, a, as, a, as an option and, um, and, then, and, then move, uh, and, then, and then move ahead um, making sure that we're uh, accounting for um, adverse event, excuse me, side effects and managing those appropriately. Um, and, and then hopefully the, the patient will in fact derive, derive benefit. All right, I'll give you the last word, Dr. Kim. Sure, uh, one last thought about the data is that, you know, it, the sort of RACIP, uh, showed a response in some of the difficult to treat um, uh, populations with some combination uh, mutations. For example, STK11, they saw good response keep on, you know, mutant KRAS G12C had a little slightly lower response rate. And, you know, I use chemo IO therapy for those with the poor prognostic uh, genetic markers, for example, KRAS plus STK11 or, you know, KIP1. 
Um, those patients progress pretty quickly on you know, chemoimmunotherapy based on my personal experience, experience in clinic. So uh, if we can use the insulin in those patients can at least induce some sh more shrinkage, I think it can have um, you know, good, good results in, in some of the patients. Yeah, you make an excellent point, which is that uh, maybe not all G12C is created equally, and maybe that there is an important role of concomitant mutations that occur. I think one of the challenges and one of the ways we need to improve in oncology is to try to figure that out. And one of the challenges in this space is when registration studies are small sample size, you just don't have the power to tease out these differences. Uh, but it would be really great if there was some registry after the fact. So we got everyone who are treating with this drug, we can look at all the mutational profile, and we can see, is there some interaction we're missing? Dr. Kim, Dr. Vandross, thank you so much for taking us through Sotorasib, the new G12C inhibitor.